The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. So begins the famous baseball poem, Casey at the Bat. And it was looking pretty grim for the Mudville team. It was the ninth inning. They were down by two runs. There's two out. But they have two people on base and their superstar, their all-star, their hero, Casey, is striding to bat. The first pitch comes and Casey casually watches it sail past, strike one. The second pitch, and again, Casey doesn't take it too seriously, strike two. But now he's got his game face on. He's down to business. He's ready to blast this next ball over the fence and win the game triumphantly. The pitch comes. The air is shattered by the strength of Casey's mighty blast. But as he swings, he strikes out. Oh no, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. Sometimes life throws us nasty curveballs, like COVID-19. This isn't the way life is supposed to be. Or we have our retirement plans all, are all made and suddenly our health goes sideways, or our relationships are going along well, and then all of a sudden there's stress, or the job that we thought was so secure suddenly seems to be in jeopardy. Our best laid plans all of a sudden seem to go sideways. And that's the situation for Joseph. His life seems to be going along in a charmed, wonderful way, and all of a sudden he's been sold into slavery. And he's being marched off to Egypt. What next? How do we handle it when life doesn't go as we planned? We're going to think about that this morning. Or maybe that's not so much our experience, but we know someone for whom that's the experience. The reality is, is that for most of us, yes, life isn't all we could want it to be. We're tired of being in our own homes. We're tired of... Um, having our activities restricted. We're tired of wearing masks. But generally, if we're honest, life isn't all that, that, that bad. But maybe we know a Joseph. We know someone whose life really has gone from good to horrible, who really is having a difficult time. How do we come alongside them? How do we be their friend in this time? If you think about Casey, he had it all. He had good looks, he had talent, he had a great swing, a wonderful personality, the admiration of all of Mudville. Joseph had it all too. He had youth, he had good looks, he had intelligence, he had insight. He had the good favor of his wealthy father, Jacob, also known as Israel. In fact, Jacob loves Joseph so much that he gave him a richly ornamented robe, which meant that Jacob really intended to make him his heir apparent. Parenting 101 tells us that singling out one child, especially the youngest child, for special treatment like this really isn't a wise move. But then Jacob has a history of making some rather questionable decisions over the years. He should know better. He came from a family of boys where one was favored over the other and it caused all sorts of problems down the road. This particular not so bright choice to favor Joseph over his older brothers had predictable results. In Genesis 37 verse 4 we read that Joseph's brothers hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph doesn't exactly help himself by making good choices either. He has a couple of dreams in which he imagines that he is the most important of all of his brothers and his older brothers are all bowing down to give him honor. And then he makes the questionable decision of telling his brothers about these dreams and rubbing their noses in it. Common sense suggests that if you have that kind of dream, it's probably better off to keep it to yourself. But Joseph doesn't do that. He can't resist strutting his own self-importance before his brothers. And the net result of Jacob's blatant favoritism and Joseph's unwise retelling of his dreams is that the brothers grab Joseph and end up selling him into slavery. Our purpose today is not to pass judgment on Jacob for his poor parenting, although we could. 
It's not to pass judgment on the brothers for the horrible way in which they treated Joseph, although we could. It's not even to pass judgment on Joseph for making the poor decision to tell his brothers about his dreams, although we could. Our purpose this morning is to see how does Joseph handle all of this misfortune? What next? How is he going to deal with it? The why question, the why Joseph is in this pickle, we could spend all day talking about Jacob and the brothers and Joseph's poor decisions, but that doesn't really matter anymore, does it? Because the situation is that he is being marched off in slavery. The more important question is, what is he going to do about it? How is he going to handle this situation? Bringing it forward to today, debating at length about why we're in the situation for COVID isn't really going to make a lot of difference. The scientists can figure that all out after the fact. The point is, is that here we are. We're in this situation. What next? How are we going to handle it? Denial isn't a helpful solution. For Joseph to pretend that he really wasn't being marched off into slavery really wouldn't help him a whole lot because there he was. For us to deny the reality of COVID-19 doesn't really help a whole lot because here we are, we're in this mess. Rationalizing in a way and pretending that it's not really that big a deal doesn't really help either because like Joseph, here we are, we've got to figure out how we're going to deal with this moving forward. Joseph eventually is going to be sold as a slave to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. He could have chosen to say, well, what next is, I'm going to be the sullen, most uncooperative, most unhelpful slave that ever was. I'll do just enough, but no more, so that I don't get a vicious beating every day. Instead, what Joseph chooses to do is he chooses to seize the opportunity to, in fact, be the best slave that he can be, to have the best attitude that he can possibly have. He's so diligent and hardworking that Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything that he owned. Joseph more than excels expectations. He does the best that he possibly can, given the situation that he's in. Life may not have been what Joseph might have anticipated or planned for back home with Jacob, but he was going to make the most of where he's at regardless. With God's help, he's going to be okay. Everything, however, is not smooth sailing. In Genesis 39, we read that Potiphar's wife makes a play for Joseph. She's a beautiful, powerful woman. Joseph's life could go from good to great but he chooses to scramble away from her clutches. He chooses integrity. He chooses to do what's right. Running from temptation is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for Potiphar. Potiphar has been good to Joseph, and he wants to honor that. It's the right thing to do for Potiphar's wife. He protects her reputation. And it's the right thing to do for Joseph's conscience because his conscience can be clear before God, knowing that he made the best choice in the circumstances. And yet it was a hard choice to make, because it cost Joseph everything. In Genesis 39, we read that Joseph is thrown into prison, and he will be in prison for between 10 to 12 long years. This is from when he is age about 18 till when he is age 30, prime years of his life, he spends in prison because he made the hard choice to do what's right. How does Joseph cope with all this? We don't know a lot about Joseph's state of mind, other than we know that he chooses consistently to do the right thing, to do what's best. But his situation reminds me a lot of another biblical character, Job. Job was another person who had a wonderful life, fine prospects, a very comfortable standard of living, security, and in an instant, poof, it was all gone. His wealth, his security, his possessions, his family, his health, done, finished, kaput. 
we do know lots about Job's state of mind. In the book of Job, there's 37 chapters of Job crying out to God again and again, why? And there is no clear answer. To use a biblical word over and over again, he laments. He complains. He pours out his heart to God. There's a long biblical tradition of lament. If you read through the Psalms, Psalm after Psalm is a lament, a cry out to God. There are times like much of 2020 when lament seems like the best response to our circumstances. That's okay. In fact, it's good. It's necessary. It's a more healthy response than denial or rationalization. Our lives sometimes may be like Joseph's, where we feel like there is little that we can do other than lament as well. And that's okay. Because when our lives crash, we need to do something now. COVID is now. Bills are due now. Relationships are crumbling now. Life hurts now. The future is bleak now. What do we do? How do we keep a good attitude, a Joseph-like attitude, even in these circumstances? Well, what we learn from Joseph and from Job is that God is always with us. He never leaves us, even in those desperate times. In fact, when Joseph is sold to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, twice scripture comments that the Lord was with Joseph. Later, when Joseph is thrown into prison after the incident with Potiphar's wife, Genesis records twice that the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And it's this presence of God being with Joseph that gives him the strength to carry on and to have that good attitude even when life seems to really be pretty miserable. In Job's case as well, God is always there. God listens. And in the end, God reveals himself in all his glory to Job and honors Job with a vision of his presence. Do we need to hear that truth? That the Lord is with us today? The Lord is with you today? The Lord will show his faithful love to you today. Nothing and no one can ever separate you from the love of God that is shown to us in Jesus Christ. That is our good news. Knowing that when we face difficult times, as we do now, do we choose what's right, even though it may cost us? Are we people of integrity, even when there's a price to be paid? Are we people of godly principle who live by the values of loving our neighbor as ourselves, of loving one another in the name of the Lord, even when that costs us something like wearing a mask, social distancing, doing those things to protect the health and safety of other people. It's not about us. It's about doing what's right for the other person. And yes, that costs us a little bit of discomfort. I don't like wearing masks, but I do because I know it's the right thing to do. It's the biblical thing to do, to care for other people, to love my neighbor as myself. And can we choose to seize the opportunity, limiting and unattractive as things might be right now compared to what we'd like, rather than getting sullen and sulky and depressed? This certainly may not be the time that we hoped for or planned for, but can we put the best spin on it possible? There's an old Chinese proverb that says, you cannot prevent the birds of sorrow from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. You cannot prevent the birds of sorrow from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. So let's swat away the birds that are trying to make a nest in our hair and see the opportunities to do some unexpected things, to reach out and care for people in unexpected ways. Charles Swindoll commented, we cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have and that is our attitude. 
I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. How am I reacting? Am I reacting with faith, knowing that God is with me in this? And there's opportunities to encourage other people, to care for other people, even in the midst of this difficult time. Am I choosing to love my neighbor as myself, even though it's a little bit uncomfortable and costs me a little bit to do so? Am I willing to make the right choices because I know that God is here and that he can bring something good and beautiful even out of these difficult times?